when it comes to fiction, women have it bad. The fact that there is a phrase, strong female character, is because many female characters aren't strong and are just thrown into the story to be a love interest. It doesn't help that the vast majority of fictional characters are male either, which is why it's great when you do encounter a good female character. Of course, females are stereotypically seen as nurturing and loving, when they're not being depicted as bitchy. Which is why it's great when you encounter a female who breaks the trend by being villainous and evil. A villain can't really serve as a love interest for the most part, and when they do, it's usually a twist that they're a villain, or they'll end up switching sides. So you can see that what I'm getting at is that women are cool and villains are cool. So I've decided to do a top 10 list of cool female villainesses. But there are so many top 10 female characters and top 10 villainesses out there. Therefore, I'm going to make it more unique by making the list a um, lot more focused to one very specific area. That is to say, Western animation. And now you might be saying, but yes, why would you intentionally ignore the awesome, amazing thing that is anime? Well, the answer is actually really, really simple. Western animation is a lot less plot focused than Eastern animation. It's more episodic and comedic, so when you do get a long, long running villain who isn't that complete joke, it's really, really cool. While in most animes, it's kind of expected to have a genuine threat as a villain. Which means that there's a lot less to choose from in Western animation, ensuring I can bring to you the true best of the best when it comes to evil deeds. But without further ado, let's start my list of top 10 female villains in Western animation. The rules are simple only one villain per franchise and no turn codes. Let's start with number 10. Back, you fools. <laughs> See the path to our glorious return to power. But I don't want. Hush! Hush, my little one. You must be exhausted. Sleep, my little Kovu. Let your dreams take wing. One day when you're big and strong, you will be a king. Good night. Good night, my little prince. Tomorrow your training intensifies. Disney has a lot of awesome 2D animated movies, and they supply this with an ample supply of great female villains. Which is why it's quite surprising that there's only one f villain from Disney's animated movie canon on this list. Even more surprising is that the movie was a sequel. I am of course talking about Zero from The Lion King 2. Zero was the off-screen mate of Scar from the first movie and was fiercely loyal to him. She was banished to the Outlands after Scar's death where she lives with the rest of Scar's followers waiting for the day to seize the Pride Lands back. The character of Zero is used to wonderful effect. She is angry, fierce and very self-righteous, believing that she has the right to allow her cubs to rule. Which is one of the most interesting things about her, and one of the things that only works because she is female. She also has teams of motherhood, something you see quite a bit of in this list. She demonstrates the plot point of a corrupted parent very well, but she is far from being heartless. While she is incredibly devoted to her cause, she does deeply care for her children, as evident when her son Nuka dies. Unfortunately, she channels all her feelings of affection into rage, leading to her ultimate defeat at her own hands. Don't move a muscle. Wow. I am completely at your mercy. You. I suppose now you bring me to justice. Let your new friends interrogate me. I wonder if your position's secure enough to survive them learning everything I know. Didn't think so. So like the Cheshire Cat, I'll just disappear. Number 9 is Cheshire from Young Justice. I had honestly never heard of this character before watching this show, which led her to be quite surprising. She is an outright villain, but you can't help but quite like her. She works with bad people and does bad things, but she seems to fit the role really well to the extent she does that she doesn't come across as a bad person, at least to me. Uh, she even has a baby with one of the protagonists during the time skip. That particular aspect of her would have been more interesting to see, but unfortunately Young Justice was cancelled after just two seasons. Which is one of the biggest crimes television has ever committed, because every second of that show was amazing. Anyway, and the subject is Cheshire. She manages to stand out distinctly in a very large cast of amazing characters, which is impressive in its own right. 
She's a very good foil to Artemis, accepting her upbringing as a, in a criminal family instead of rejecting it. And while in most shows that would make a character seem petty or misguided, in Shadow's case she seems quite happy. Like Zira, she still has compassion for her family, even when fighting against them. Yet despite all the praise I give her, she still comes across as ruthless and probably would kill her sister if it was in the heat of battle. She's still alive by the end of the series, and with the way things turn out, she probably would have continued to make appearances with ambiguous sides and wishes on had the series continued, but alas, it did not, and we'll just have to make do what we have. Back, you fools. <laughs> I knew my past would come back to haunt me one day. Shigo. Ready when you are. Sorry, Kimmy. The Supreme One always delegates. Dr. D, you're on. Number 8 is Shigo from Kim Possible. Shigo's an example of a punch clock villain. She's only assisting in world domination because of the paycheck involved, and the writers use this to excellent effect. She's sarcastic, lazy, annoying, and generally unhelpful, unless she is need to fight someone, in which case she kicks a lot of ass. The dynamic between Shigo and Rakan is one of the funniest things in the show. Despite being underlined, however, she proves herself to be quite intelligent. More than happy to point out flaws and plans and occasionally making half serious, half sarcastic suggestions. But by far the most noteworthy example of her savvy intelligence is the tree parter, where she stops following the orders of others and decides to take over the world herself, which she manages to do very effectively. Overall, Chico is one of the most prominent and, in my opinion, likable characters in the show, and by all means, she deserves it. In fact, she's so likable that in the, third, in the fourth season, a lot of the sub villains break her out of prison instead of Draken, which is also used to hilarious effect. I can't really say much more about Chigo, but I really like her as a character, and I think many people who watch the series do. Back, you fools. <laughs> Drop of desire. <laughs> Not here. A pinch of passion. <laughs> Just a hint of lust. <laughs> Excuse me. <gasps> Sorry to barge in like this, but. Uh... What in Grim's name are you doing here? Number seven is the Fairy Godmother from Shrek 2. I think the Fairy Godmother was a great route to take in the second film, taking a stereotypically good character and making her the antagonist without changing a whole lot what the character is about. She still wants to get the prince to marry the princess and still uses magic to do it just like in the original tales. Except the princess doesn't want to marry the prince and the prince is her son. As far as from the idea, she is also written very well with some genuine funny lines. She doesn't a whole lot more than a standard bit old woman persona, with traits of a business woman in, in it, but it's pulled off remarkably well and while she doesn't interact a whole lot with Shrek, when the two do interact, there is a great dynamic. The fairy godmother is sneaky, conniving and in a straight up battle very very powerful, all traits to do well in a good villain. The climax of Shrek 2 is among my favourite parts in the series, and that is a large part of that is down to the wonderful part play played by the fairy godmother. Back, you fools. <laughs> Science has given us a tremendous gift. Nanites. We've seen what they can do. The good and the bad. But their true potential has been largely unseen until now. Our goals are varied. Fame. Power. Revenge. Well, order. Yet one thing unites us. Greed. You surprised I admit it? Well, don't be. You'll never get far in life without wanting it all. And for those who might consider standing in our way, we'll let our powers speak for themselves. The world is ours. And no one can stop us. Number 6 is Black Knight from Generator Rex. Black Knight only comes onto the scene in the third season, which when the, is when the plot of the series actually picks up, so that's okay. Overall, Black Knight is actually pretty generic. Her goal is to become a god, which she intends to do by manipulating and worming her way into her superior circle. 
She also immorally brainwashes mutated people and animals to suit her needs. So if that's generic, then why has she managed to place number 6 in this list? Well, it's mostly because of her style and a wonderful performance by Jennifer Hale. She's cruel, cold and logical, but also inviting and made sure not to do too much blatant evil in front of Rex in hopes of getting him to join her side, at least initially. And unlike a lot of villains in her position, she isn't overly proud or arrogant, perfectly willing to lower herself to working with the good guys if there was a threat to both of them. Overall, she made a great change of pace as the leader of Providence, and it was really cool seeing a female character take such a central role as a villain. Sure, she might have been working under a group of men, but she managed to play all of them for fools and was even able to outright kill one of them without any backlash. She proves to be capable in combat too, but only in the finale do we find out she was an improved version of the experiment that made Rex. Something I would have liked if they developed and introduced earlier, especially since it was quickly rendered unimportant when she became a mech. But at the end of the series, there's still some mystery surrounding her. Exactly what kind of interaction she had with Rex and everyone else involved in the original Nano project is still relatively unknown, along with how she planned to escape in the ending. Personally, I was hoping it would reveal that she was Rex's mother, but unfortunately that seems to be debunked by the finale. Uh, overall, Black Knight is generic, but still cool enough villain to make a number 6 spot, in my book. Back, you fools. <laughs> Hey, everything all right? Rodesky's looking for you. Paul here is your friend, but I bet you never practiced fighting him. I'm afraid you'd lose that bet, rogue. Hello, Scott. Are you more surprised to see me? Or me? <laughs> Principal Dark... Your mystique? Something Professor Xavier neglected to tell you. Nice of him, wasn't it? You have no idea what he's been hiding from you. Let me fill you in. You X-Men are nothing but puppets for Charles Xavier. And I am a sharp blade cutting your strings just so I can watch you fall! <laughs> no! Number 5 is Mystique from X-Men Evolution. I've always been fond of shapeshifters, their ability to completely fool the characters in the universe and oftentimes completely fool the audience make them a great storytelling asset. There's literally so much you can do with a shapeshifter, and Mystique makes full use of this fact. She gives the heroes a bad reputation, she infiltrates and steals things from the hero's base, and at one point she even kidnaps the professor and impersonates him for several episodes, which really just caught me off guard. But Mystique isn't just a shapeshifter alone, she has her own character and her own character arc. At first she's just a lackey of Magneto, but as the series goes on he disregards her merits, which causes her to start working against him. And that brings about the best parts of Mystique, her relationship with and interaction with other characters. She constantly insults and demeans the Brotherhood boys, but was still the one who brought them together and gives them purpose, which results in them being more loyal to her than Magneto. She seemed to have an interesting relationship with Agatha Harkness and Irene Adler as well, but we didn't really see a lot of that. Uh, but by far the most interesting relationship she has is with Kurt, who she is the biological mother of, and Rogue, who she is the adopted mother of. Two members of the main cast of Good Guys. The mixed feelings involved with all three of these characters makes some of the best ram in the show, and Mystique is at the centre of it all. Mystique is dangerous, smart, but very angry and reckless, which is why she safely takes the number 5 spot on this list. Back, you fools. <laughs> no, no, it's alright. Listen to me. All of this is as it should be. No! You were wrong about the world. <laughs> And you were wrong about me. And I will never let you use my hair again. You want me to be the bad guy? Fine. Now I'm the bad guy. Number four on this list is Mother Gothel from Tangled. Of all the women on this list, Mother Gothel is the greatest example of evil motherhood. Even though she is not actually Rapunzel's mother, they share a very, very genuine mother-daughter bond, with Rapunzel even believing she is her true mother. It is not clear whether she shares any genuine affection for Rapunzel or just wants to use her, but it is clear that Rapunzel has genuine affection for her and Mother Gothel uses this to her advantage. She's the kind of character who understands love and knows how to use it as a weapon, which is something I don't think we see enough of in fiction. She, ca she captures real life traits of an abusive relationship so well that Rapunzel doesn't even realise how horrible Mother Gothel is to her. She doesn't physically hurt Rapunzel for the most part, her effect as a villain is entirely mental. One of the funniest moments in the film displays this really well when you look at it in ret retrospect. 
Even when Mother Gottel personally catches up to Rapunzel, she doesn't force her back. She manipulates Rapunzel into believing it is her fault and that she is in the wrong in this case. Mother Gottel and Rapunzel is by far one of my favourite character relationships in Disney canon, and together, along with some fancy frying pan fighting, it makes one of the best Disney films I've seen in a long, long time. Thank you, fools! I have a name too, Goliath. The humans gave it to me long ago. You should know it before you die. I am Demona. Goodbye, Goliath. Number three goes to Demona from Gargoyle's fame. If you haven't heard about gargoyles, then I should probably start by telling you the story of a clan of gargoyles who turn to stone during the day and hunt at night. They are betrayed by humans they agreed to protect, and because of the magic spell were forced to remain statues for a thousand years until they woke in modern day New York. Except for Demona, who instead became an immortal and lived out those thousand years being hunted by humans. As a result, she has grown to be extremely vengeful, bitter and angry as a person. She believes humans are literally the worst thing ever and deserve to be wiped out from existence. So much so that she very quickly turns on her former clanmates the moment they start showing any sympathy for humans. She is a consistent antagonist throughout the series and probably the biggest one if you don't count Xanatos, who is so damn affable that it's hard to see him as a bad guy. A lot of great episodes are dedicated to the Mona, but by far the best are the ones that detail her tragic backstory, which is a huge ripoff of Mebet, a really blatant one at that considering Mebet is a character in the universe who kicks ass in the trench coat. Anyway, the tragic thing about her isn't that a lot of awful stuff happened to her, it's mostly that it was all her own doing. The initial portrayal of her clan was sparked by her. The subsequent betrayals as she lived in Aiton, Scotland were all brought about because she tried to out-betray those she thought were betraying her. And she really should have seen coming when a clone of her love interest started spouting clone power rants and left her for her own clone. It's a really weird series, but trust me, it's really, really good. Anyway, Demona is a really, really great character. All her suffering is by her own hand, but she has made her so hateful that she refuses to see anything as being her own fault and instead challenge her anger into hating an entire species. If you haven't seen Gargoyles yet, then I really suggest you check it out. The one is really cool, and it's a pretty cool show overall. Down. Who created the hunter? Canmore destroyed the last of us. Who betrayed Macbeth to Canmore? Your thirst for vengeance has only created more sorrow. End the cycle, Demona. Give us the code. The access code is... Alone. Back, you fools. <laughs> ah, my pet. You were a thing of beauty. A whispering lake of sand that preyed upon the weak. Until the guardians turned you into this frozen dish. Well, revenge is a dish best served cold. Quintessence. Would you like to taste of that dish, my walking sand pit? The second spot on my list goes to another series you likely haven't watched, which funnily enough had Greg Wiseman as a showrunner. The same guy who created Gargoyles and was in charge of Young Justice and Spectacular Spider-Man. That guy is awesome, but for some reason he has never been allowed to produce the third season of anything, which is a shame. Anyway, number two goes to Nerissa from Witch. The characters of the series have a whole take with the mantle type job, and Nerissa was one of the previous heroes of the last generation. Their leader, in fact. But her greed and envy caused her to lose her status as leader, which only further influenced her corruption, and even caused her to murder one of her friends. She's first seen as an elderly woman, but she has shapeshifting powers, so we get to see a fair amount of her younger self too. Both of pretty cool designs, I might add. What's more interesting about Nerissa is her t intelligence. She starts off as much weaker than the villain of the previous season. In fact, she subtly helped the heroes take him down. But her ability to use what small power she still does possess, teleporting, bestowing life, and as I mentioned, shapeshifting, are used to great effect. Most of season 2 is spent watching Nerissa run rings around the teenage protagonist, defeating and humiliating them in e every turn. I mentioned before how I like shapeshifters, well Nerissa is another great shapeshifter, deceiving, shaming, and framing her, her enemies. 
I get the impression that she's only toying with the protagonist a lot of the time and probably could have wiped him out if she wanted to. I mean, she knows their identities and where they live, and she's not below attacking their friends or family, which is really shown when she kidnaps one of their boyfriends and turns him into a slave. Even when she has all the hero's mentors brainwashed to her side, she just loafs around enjoying her victory. When she is eventually defeated, she manages to succeed further by getting the best prison one could hope to ask for, trapped in a realm of dreams with no knowledge of the fact, believing she conquered the world and can do anything she wants. They literally gave her anything she could dream of. She's also a mother of a major cast member too, which further throws in teams of corrupted parenthood. Really, that along with her intelligence, merciless cruelty, cunning and awesome powers really show why Nerissa is up so high on this list. She hits the ball out of the park in pretty much every category to the extent that it would take a pretty awesome character to beat her for the number one spot. Unfortunately for her, her there is a cruel, cunning villainess who does manage to outdo her. Okay, number one is Azula from Avatar The Last Airbender. There's not much point trying to hype it up. If you've seen the show, you've probably known this is coming. Furthermore, if you've seen the show, I don't really have to explain a whole lot as to why Azula is so awesome. If you haven't seen the show, then you totally should like right now. It's one of the best pieces of television ever created. Seriously. Anyway, Azula is a little young to have any of the motherhood aspects that many of the other these other characters have, but she still fulfills the role as an evil family member quite well with her relationship with Zuko. It really shows female independence when the younger sister in the, of the heir to the throne is the bully in the sibling relationship. On a list full of deceivers, manipulator, corruptors, god seekers, and general style maniacs, Azula still probably tops them all as the crudest. In fact, she partook in a little genocide herself. She spends most of the season 2 hunting her own brother, but in the end effortlessly converts him back to her side just to mess with him because she seriously enjoys messing with people. This is displayed very well in an episode where she tries to interact with normal teenagers in a normal setting and finds that while she knows people very well she needs to manipulate them, if she doesn't have anything evil planned then she can't hold up a conversation. Just look at how she reacts to winning a volleyball game. She even goes so far as to torment her apparent friends just to have them by her side. She believes that fear is the only way to control people and when proven wrong she kind of goes crazy. I mean literally, she was clearly psychopathic to begin with but by the end of the series she is in need of some serious treatment. A mental breakdown that was done incredibly well but I think that aspect of her character gets too much focus when her character up to that point was already amazingly well done. We see a lot of Zula from the second season on and sh the show just couldn't be the same without her. The only thing I would like to see more of is the relationship she shared with her father. Did he make her that way, or was she just plain evil to begin with? Regardless, she manages to do a very impressive job of being a villain, to the extent where she almost out overshadows her father as the main antagonist, and even in the universe that's considered just as big a threat has to be taken down simultaneously in the finale. Because on top of being awesome in the character department, she's pretty awesome in the powers and abilities department. She's known as a progeny of firebending, even able to perform techniques that only her fully grown adult father has mastered. Oh yeah, the fact that she's like 14 is what makes a lot of what she is so awesome. Anyway, whenever she appears on screen, the characters generally have to run because she tends to kick ass and take no names. She even gets credit for being the only person to conclusively defeat Aang in battle. Sadistic, smart, powerful and downright despicable, Azula is by far my favourite female villain in western animation. This is Dedicated Specialist signing off. Subscribe, comment and tell me how you feel about this video and have a great Christmas.